Uh, my name is Chris Gonzalez, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the third event in the spring series of Distinguished Lecturers sponsored by the uh, NYU Abu Dhabi Institute. Um, tonight's lecturer is Tyler Volk, uh, and I think it will be a really um, wonderful, interesting lecture. Um, Tyler is a director of the environmental program at NYU in New York. And he's a colleague of mine in the biology department. I'm a professor uh, in biology at NYU. And um, Tyler is a very uh, interesting person who's actually back here by popular demand teaching a J-term course on the state of the Earth. Uh, he had, he's written a very interesting book um, called CO2 Rising, uh, in which he personifies an atom of CO2 named Dave, I think, to try to help people understand the carbon cycle, uh, and uh, he had a, a conversation here in 2009, and uh, it was very wildly popular, and so he's uh, back teaching this course, and I believe he just took his students to the, um, to the wastewater yes, management plant, and it was very, very interesting because uh, much of the water that's used for to irrigate all the plants around here is, um, uh, is, comes from, recycled, recyc from reclaimed water. And I just want to say a few words about Tyler um, before we start to give you a little bit of an idea about his background and who he is through my eyes. Um, he is, uh, although he works in a very different field from me, uh, when I met Tyler at NYU, I realized immediately that he was really a beacon of positive energy. And whenever you talk to him, he's bubbling with enthusiasm about things. And he can talk about a million different topics. And it's really stimulating and exciting. And, um, I think anyone who talks to him can realize very quickly uh, that behind these shining eyes is a real burning intellect and a real passion for life. And he has a really deep curiosity about how the world works. And uh, so he's really an inspiration for me, and I hope for you, um, about how really an insatiable curiosity can really nurture a very rich life of the mind, and that this in turn can drive a very um, uh, full and purposeful and meaningful life. And I think that that's one of the great aspirations of organizing this Abu Dhabi NYU enterprise is to stimulate and motivate and uh, inspire people to connect their intellectual pursuits with realizing some very useful goal in life and, 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 and in the world. So. Tyler, like I think many bright people around the world, um, being curious in many different things, uh, his curiosity has led him to explore really a wide range of different uh, activities and different topics. Um, but I feel that he's been motivated throughout his whole life by a really singular appreciation of the natural world and how important it is to take care of it and also a deep concern for the effect that human beings are having on the planet. And so his desire to really understand how it all fits together has led him to a, a sort of a spiraling, but I think a very continuous lifelong arc of trying to understand patterns in the world and systems at all different scales. And, and, and he's uh, explored these ideas in a variety of uh, topics. So um, just a brief uh, little history, and then I'll get straight to the lecture. Um, Tyler was born in Tonawanda, New York. He grew up very close to Niagara Falls, and he had the opportunity to really enjoy the great out of doors and really appreciate the woods and spend a lot of time wandering around outside. And I think any of us who have had that chance, it really makes you feel a great awe and inspiration for how beautiful the world is and can be. Um, he went to study physics at the University of Michigan, uh, but for a variety of reasons, including a desire to do something really applied in the world, he's transitioned into architecture. And he spent a number of years as a private builder. Uh, he designed and implemented a solar bath. Maybe it was the first solar powered bath, I don't know, but it sounds really cool and fun. I wish I'd been there. Um, and he, <laughs> in addition to teaching at NYU, he's uh, engaged in a variety of other um, teaching uh, enterprises. He's uh, worked at a uh, taught at a middle school, he taught at the School for Visual Arts, he's participated in adult education. So he's really a person who likes to engage people and, and you know, help them discover new ideas and become excited by them. 
he went to graduate school at NYU also, in addition to being a professor there, uh, because he was motivated to try to understand at a quantitative level um, how we could build sustainable energy systems. And he um, uh, started at that point becoming interested in greenhouse gases and in the carbon cycle, which eventually led to this book that I mentioned earlier, CO2 Rising. Um, and he, interestingly, something I didn't know before I looked at his bio on the NYU webpage, which you're all, you should really all go investigate, it's pretty cool. Um, he uh, worked on advanced life support systems for NASA to try to design and build systems which would allow uh, astronauts to survive for long periods of time uh, on, on, uh, in environments other, you know, other than the Earth, for example, Moon or Mars, if we ever have colonies in, in other places. And uh, this is one example of sort of a long-term interest that he's had in um, uh, whole Earth theory, or what can be called sometimes Gaia theory. Uh, and I think that um, he'll probably touch upon this some, somehow in the lecture tonight. I don't know if directly. Um, and the last thing I want to say about him is not only is he a great intellect and teacher and inspirational speaker, uh, but he's a musician. And he has a band uh, called the Amygdaloids. And uh, the amygda amygdala is a part of the brain, which is uh, named after the Greek word for almond because it has this almond shape. And it's the place in the brain where uh, it is thought that we um, process um, and uh, transfer to memory our emotional reactions to the world. So with that, I would like to welcome Tyler. OK, I'm so pl uh, pleased to be here. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for that introduction. I want to take your classes. You speak so well. I want to, uh, and this is my second time here at El Memora. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm teaching, anyway, as Chris said. I want to thank everybody at the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, uh, including Phil and Nils, who helped me out. Uh, Fabio's here, the provost of, of NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, some students, perhaps, of mine are here. Is that uh, anybody here from the January class yet? The yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Sitting so close to the front, I didn't recognize you. Hi, uh, Nishant and, and Tay. Maybe some others are here too. Uh, all right. Uh, what am I going? Where am I going to start? Uh, yes. There is an old saying that there's two things that humans should not stare at for too long a period of time. One is the sun, which you all know you can go blind if you look at the sun too much, and the other is death. To not really you know, think about it too much. And so here I am asking you to stare at it for you know, maybe 45 minutes or so, and then in a Q&A session as well. So that doesn't seem to be fitting that idea at all. And I'm going I'm to really you know, sort of put it in your face here, um, the existence of death in the world. Before I left New York City to come here, uh, I went to see an exhibit at the Japan Society on one of my favorite uh, sort of personages, philosophers, the late 1600s into mid-1700s uh, Zen Japanese master, Zen master called Hakuin. And I was struck there in this exhibit of his paintings that you probably will never see again all assembled like this. Not all of them, but the whole number of them. There was one of them that just had the Japanese uh, um, uh, logogram for death as the one word. Is, that was the painting, death. And the reason the caption said is because Hakuin thought that in the line of the Zen tradition of koans, which are uh, sayings or perplexities, in fact, he was the one that invented the saying, what is the sound of one hand clapping, uh, which is very famous. These koans, he thought death could be a one-word koan. And in a koan, these puzzles, you're supposed to stare at it all the time. You're supposed to have nothing else on your mind for a long, long time. So Hakuin was exactly uh, the opposite of don't stare at death too long. He said, you know, that's all you should think about for, and you're going you're gonna to have this great illumination uh, happen. So what I hope today to do is to get you to stare at it, have some uh, mini illuminations uh, during this, uh, at and at minimum show you some aspects of death, which uh, at least some of which you have maybe not known about or thought about before. The idea being here that if we examine death not just from the human perspective of, uh, of 
you know, fear of death or sadness at death or, uh, you know, b b various kinds of beliefs. But death in various aspects from the physical world up into the biological and into the cultural, we will see that death has many manifestations that are not just simple endings, but are deeply, deep intertwinings with life itself, so much so that we can say that really conclusively that life is, would not be what it is were it not for death on all these different scales. Now the single word death uh, typically would mean endings of things. Astronomers can talk about deaths of galaxies. Uh, you might think of you know, the deaths of corporations with bankruptcy laws or, or corporations crashing. And, you know, we can use the word death in various metaphoric ways. Uh, and and so, so in, a, in a sense, it's endings, endings at different scales. When you think about it, many of the scales of nature have endings of systems. And as, as Chris so kindly mentioned, I'm, I'm very interested in, in patterns of systems at different scales. And so in one sense, death is, 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 are these endings. I'm not going to cover corporations. There's lots of endings I'm not going to cover. But what I do, do want to do is not just say it's endings, but to look at some of the details of the endings to try to show you, uh, as Chris also said, how, how, how wonderful nature is in its very manifestations. So a lot of the talk is going to be around some of the biological aspects of death, but I will begin with the physics and end with the, uh, with the culture. And I've put this talk into, I've tried to, you can think of it as the evolution of death. So we're going to use death as a way to take, to go through the big picture of the cosmic history from the origin of the universe up until present day, uh, human perplexities about psychology. So in a way, death is a doorway into, look, into telling a story. So I'm going to try to do it as a narrative uh, in stages, story, so, in, so in chapters, so to speak. And I'll see if I can get this going. Yes. So uh, first we have the Earth. And just, as, just to symbolize, we're going to be thinking kind of big uh, whole Earth systems today and everything that the Earth contains on it. So stage one, the immortal atoms. Uh, now, the atoms, uh, the hydrogen and helium began shortly after the Big Bang, about 13.7 billion years ago, a long time ago. Uh, it's a fairly well-established fact that the universe began in kind of a creation. It's not clear whether there were multi-universes or what came before. Uh, but at least in our universe, uh, shortly afterwards, hydrogen and helium were able to form during the cooling, the gradual cooling that has taken place. But after the hydrogen, helium, and a tiny bit of lithium, atoms are born, the atoms of our bodies, for example, nitrogens, the carbons that form our bodies, were born in supernova explosions. And this is not exactly a supernova, but it's, it's a sequence of images of, of, an, of a nebula expanding and exploding. Uh, centers of stars that are very large that create uh, higher elements in them, such as uh, oxygen and carbon, uh, during the combustion of, of hydrogen and helium if, through the fusion reactions in stars, these atoms are dispersed in these fantastic explosions called supernovas. Otherwise, they'd stay inside these stars. And during these supernovas, you also get the creation of the many, many the higher elements, uh, such as uh, the metals, are created in this enormous energy of the supernova explosion. So as these explosions go out, these atoms that were made in the stars, manufactured in the stars, uh, uh, come out and expand and, and then get dispersed into clouds, which form new generations of stars and planets. And these uh, atoms, once they were formed, are virtually immortal, except for when there are changes in the nuclei of the atoms, which can sometimes happen in the atmosphere with cosmic rays or through nuclear reactions. But for the most part, the atoms of your body, the carbon atoms of your body, formed at some point before the formation of the Earth, because they, they were here, they've been here for four and a half billion years of Earth history. So they were formed in stars, at least, at least we know that before that time. And so they are all, for all practical purposes, uh, immortal, uh, going round and round. So they form the galaxies. And this, is, in a way, is the, is the dream 
of trying to overcome death is to be uh, an atom of carbon, which is here in the center of the carbon dioxide molecule, all important for uh, global warming, of course. Uh, and this carbon, carbon molecule and the carbon dioxide can go uh, around and around. And I'll show you the importance of that for understanding how the biosphere or the, the surface of the Earth works uh, in a second. But the atoms are virtually uh, immortal. So they don't really uh, die in the sense that other systems die, although molecules can come into being and uh, or not. And as these molecules came into being, eventually life formed. And so s stage two in this evolution of death is with the origin of life came the origin of death. Now this is not uh, exactly obvious because you could say uh, the origin of life, which is very, uh, there's a big a lot of unknowns about the origin of life, I should say. Although recently, as I was reading a book called Life Ascending by, uh, by Nick Lane, a British biochemist, which I highly recommend, I was surprised at, in his chapter on the origin of life how far some of the uh, lab work and the theory has gone uh, with the origin of life. How, how, in a way, some of the molecules of life could have been made by non-living pathways, probably in deep sea vents. There's a lot of, lot of converging evidence that the deep sea vents were the, the origin site. And I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. But it's not obvious because that the origin of life would be the origin of death because uh, bacteria often, uh, well, they, when they divide into uh, two bacteria and then those halves grow and make new bacteria and, and divide again, sometimes bacteria have been called uh, immortal, potentially immortal, were something not to happen to them. They to be eaten or they run out of nutrients. Uh, but, they, but they do run out of nutrients and we can see that the origin of life had to be the origin of death in the following calculation. So here I show you the, uh, one of the black smokers, the deep sea vents, and as I said, there's lots of evidence that life may have formed in tiny little pores within the rocks of these vents. There's some indications that some key parts of, of universal molecules are, are structured in a way that, that are found naturally in the chemistry of these vents. But anyway, you can take a bacterium replicating once a year. That's very slow. Bacteria in our, in our gut can replicate it less than an hour. They can replicate. But so the, some of the ones in the earth and the soils replicate much sl more slowly. A single bacterium would basically eat up the entire planet of earth in 100 years. Uh, as it kept on replicating in, in an immortal kind of way, splitting, replicating again, splitting, replicating again, through the magic of uh, biological compound interest. So this is not going to happen. The whole earth is not edible. And that means uh, a lot of bacteria are going to die uh, during this process. So with the origin of life, we for sure can say that death began. It's a very simple kind of death. It's, it's a death. Uh, of the kind that is just not really planned in any kind of way by the bacterium. And you might say you know, planned, you know, no life form plans death. But I'm going to show you in a moment that there is planned death in a more advanced evolutionary sense. So this is death in an unplanned sense, but was incredibly important for the evolutionary process. Uh, Carl Sagan was one. There's a beautiful quote by the famous astronomer and writer Carl Sagan that uh, without death there would have been no evolution because without death there would be no sort of comparison between similar organisms for creatures that might live a little better or a little worse given certain kinds of tasks. Were there no death, there would be no selective process. There'd be no generations. You need, you need generations to have it changes that can be regarded as, as clear improvements if you can define these improvements with, with respect to certain kinds of lifestyles. So even though this early death was inadvertent, was not planned, very simple kind of death, it did, pow it did start the generational process of evolution. So it was really, really crucial to create new kinds of forms of life, and as I'm going to discuss, new forms uh, of death. So this takes us to stage three. Uh, the chemical cycles, what I call chemical cycles and uh, predation. 
Now, uh, the chemical cycles have to do with the fact that beautiful, beautiful system of, of this Gaia uh, circulating biosphere chemicals. Wastes of certain creatures end up being nutrients for other kinds of creatures. And certainly the most famous example of this that is learned in grade school, but I'm going to bring up again in a new kind of way for you tonight, is the fact that the carbon dioxide that comes from our breath, the com the, that, that, we, that is generated in our bodies because we are carbon-fueled beings eating food that contains carbon and creating CO2 as a waste gas, uh, 5 times 10 to the 20th, an astounding number of molecules with each exhalation uh, is created here that goes out into the atmosphere and starts sp spreading around. Well, this is exactly what plants need to grow. So it's a very famous example, but it's, it's, it's so wonderful that our, the waste from our metabolism is the nutrient to other creatures as plants. And so in a sense, uh, us causing deaths of creatures by eating them, we create this wet waste gas CO2, which goes out and creates more life. There's these cycles going on, and so it's not just a matter of life forms die inadvertently that powered evolution, but now they get hooked up with each other in these uh, intertwined cycles of life and death and waste forming nutrients of new kind of life, such that the CO2 that goes out from my breath and this carbon atom Dave here that Chris mentioned before can be in a, come out, come out of my breath in a CO2 molecule can go into a bicarbonate ion, the most uh, uh, abundant form of carbon in the ocean, or it can be in a cellulose molecule. All the black here are carbon atoms in a gangly cellulose molecule inside a plant. And these carb, these immor so the immortality of carbon is brought into these chemical cycles of life forms using each each other's death or, or waste to, to make their own life, the result is much more life than would be there otherwise. For example, one can calculate that were the carbon not to be recycled photo, and photosynthesis, were photosynthesis to be limited to the CO2 coming out of volcanoes, the new stuff, there would only be about one two hundredth, 0.5 percent of the photosynthetic photosynthesis that there is today on today's world. So this intertwined cycle of life and death with these chemical cycles has, in a sense, amplified all of life uh, by 200 times. And so I, I've calculated that, that from one's breath, it goes out and circulates around the planet. It turns out that in the next year, your breath has fed about 50 atoms of carbon going into the molecules of the plant is formed as CO2 going into the plant's leaves. Every plant on the planet, every leaf on the planet contains about 50 atoms that you exhaled in, from every single exhalation that you gave out in the previous year. So, so parts of your waste are in every leaf of the planet in the coming year. And uh, painters have painted uh, cycles of various kinds. So here you see the plants and the animals. Uh, Hieronymus Bosch did not know that he was painting the carbon cycle. Uh, but I say he was. So we'll leave it as that. Stage four, programmed cell death in bacteria. Now I mentioned that so far these cycles are getting formed through life and death intertwinings that are inadvertent, the, the death itself is inadvertent, yet is powering evolution and is, and is creating more life through the intertwining of the nutrient cycles than would exist otherwise. But now an amazing thing happened and it first began in the bacteria. There started being planned forms of death and in biology in the most general term is being called programmed cell death in certain kinds of bacteria that form particularly the ones that form 
multicellular colonies in which there's some differentiation of function during their reproductive stages. Programmed cells and bacteria. Uh, this is a Streptomyces. It's a uh, soil bacterium. The genus can give rise to strep throat, but there's other genuses as well. And Streptomycetes, in its, in its cycle, in its life cycle, can go from being a free spore here on the left to uh, living as bacteria in the soil, which can uh, live by themselves, but then they can grow into colonies as it goes around the cycle. And these colonies, in their final spore, spore forming stage can have some differentiation of function in which some of the bacterial uh, tubes will form structures which, which funnel up certain um, cell materials and, and end up being physical structures to support the other bacteria in the colony that are going to actually make the spores. The importance of this is that some of the bacteria in the colony are, in a sense, taking roles that are going to be dead ends. They are not themselves going to be reproducing into the spore-forming stage. The reason this can happen genetically is primarily because these colonies are, are often clones. And so the ones that are going to die, and in a sense, end up being in suicidal roles for support of the others, are genetically identical to the ones that do form spores. But there are very interesting issues here about cheats, about genetic mutants that might not get, be, want to be in the support stocks of these, of these uh, colonies. So it's not as the simple story I just told you about that they're all clones. But it is known that there is differentiation in the reproductive stage. And some of these, the differentiation is to, into those that are going to create the spores to carry on to the next generation and those that are going to die to help the others. The same kind of thing happens in bacteria like uh, bacteria, uh, Bacillus uh, subtilis, which is studied in the NYU uh, biology department in New York City. And this also has a, a kind of a mother cell that gives rise to a spore and the mother cell ends up dying. It's not like a bacterium that just splits and they both sides end up continuing living. This one side is going to give special materials to the other side, sort of help the other side go and then die itself. It's kind of a traditional, they call it the mother spore, but there's no, there's no uh, uh, gender here really. You know, it's just the, the, typically the, the, it's called that. Uh, but this spore that gives rise to uh, death it's in itself to support the, the, the offspring cell. So it's very interesting. Now, this cell suicide ends up in the evolutionary story I'm telling you here is going into what I'm going to call stage five in this story of the intertwining of death and life. Cell suicide in the development toolkit of complex organisms. That includes us, we're complex enough. Plants and fungi are the prim primary ones I'm going to think about, but there's also amoeba-type creatures, amoebazoa, that, that have these co reproductive colonies, actually quite similar to some of the bacteria and what they, they divide into the support structures. They form these sort of water tower uh, columns, and then they form these, the, the, some of the amoebas go into these giant balls that are going to form the spores. It's really an interesting uh, evolutionary uh, um, um, discovery or, or invention. But the, uh, one of the words here, in, especially in animal, in animal cells, is called apoptosis. And these, these apoptotic cells, it's now looking that all the cells of our body, the, 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 it, it's looking like they all have these suicide programs in them. So it's not that certain cells are, are sort of just making suicide. They all have the, it in them, and sometimes they can go into suicide if they get aberrant, if they get abnormal in, in their development. Uh, but also, it can be, it's used in the immune system for cells that di didn't, uh, didn't connect with the, the agents that, are trying, that the immune system is trying to get rid of. Those cells will go into apoptosis. And when they go into apoptosis, this, cell, this, this death is not, just, uh, it's not just dead and, okay, you know, slough me off. This death is a, a very much of a program that happens with inside the cell. Uh, I think the next slide shows you. I mean, there are all kinds of biochemical pathways that happen during these suicide programs. And the mitochondria, 
that are the power plants of the cell are important in releasing certain substances in the, in the process of the suicide program. And there's a lot of research going on now about to what extent these suicide programs are ancestral, and they, they seem to be ancestral before the evolution of plants and animals and fungi, but there's also some independent uh, developments within the plants and animals and fungi. So I just want to go back and show you this, this apoptotic cell on the lower left here. Um, a whole program is run in which the cell self-dissolves, and it, 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 in a way it goes into little packages that can be easily recycled by the body. It's, it's, it's actually a, a, a kind of a, a death uh, program, kind of a, kind of a funeral process uh, that happens with these cells. So it's a very active, it's not that, it's, it has only like the last 20 years have been sort of the golden age of, of studying in, this, uh, in the cells. And there's a lot of research now about that we know it happens in plants and animals and fungi and some of these other eukaryote uh, amoebozoas that I mentioned before. Uh, it's very important in how the animals become what they are. So here's one of the famous examples of this uh, cell uh, apoptosis or cell suicide being used creatively and in a, in a vital part of the creature's development. This is the tadpole, tadpole turning into a frog. And at some point, you've probably sort of seen this happen. It's really wonderful if you're a kid putting the tadpole in and watching it become a frog. The tail disappears. It becomes a frog and it starts going, it goes from the aquatic stage to being able to hop on land and be aquatic and swim. But going from something that looks more like a fish to something that looks like a, uh, uh, like, well, like a frog. This tail, the way it's done, it, it's not, the tail does not dr uh, drop off and uh, get sloughed off. It gets all recycled into the frog. And that happens through this, this cell suicide program. It, you know, it's, it's, oh, okay, it gets recycled in the frog, but though that, that tail is living cells. How does that happen? Those cells go, there's signals given to those cells to turn on their suicide programs. As I said, it looks like all the cells of these complex organisms have these suicide programs potentially. They turn on those suicide programs, it's recycled, and it, it builds into the body of the frog. It also happened to us in, the, in, the, uh, the, in the, the, the embryo stage, uh, and it happens to mice as well. A really famous example of this cell suicide program being used in development is the fact that in the development of paws, the, or, or the fingers, it's not that the fingers are like parts of a tree that, that start off as buds and then just grow. They, the hand starts as sort of like a paddle, and you see it here on the left, this paw development, and then what happens, <coughs> zones form from certain pattern formation inside, inside this, this multicellular uh, um, uh, kind of organ there of the hand. And certain zones die. And again, they don't die and, and go to the environment. They die and are recycled back into, into so, so that fingers form by the cells dying in between. And this has been shown. This, these processes of death, sometimes death is now in the suicide, it's being called a sculptor of, 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 of the multicellular uh, creature. Uh, it happens in, in fungi as well, and I'm going to show you in a minute in plants. Uh, it's, it's been shown in lab experiments that if you turn off some of the genes, if you silence some of the genes that are responsible for these cell suicide programs, uh, the creature will, will die in many cases if you turn off too much of it because it, it can't form. It, it, death is completely necessary for the formation of the complex, complex uh, uh, physiology that we have and we share with the mice and the frog and even the plants. To me, this is one of the most uh, kind of uplifting uh, examples because trees are allowed to grow uh, up uh, because of the fact that tubes were invented in the evolutionary process. Uh, about 400 million years ago during the Devonian, we have clear fossil evidence that plants went from being little small moss type things that do not really have these tubes, that's all that, and that's all they could have been if they were just relying on water to diffuse up. Uh, but then tubes got invented and within about 30 or 40 million years, you can see in the fossil record, plants went from being maybe 
a half a centimeter high to trees, to forests. Not exactly the forest we have today, but in a very short time. And one of the key inventions were these tubes called uh, uh, phloems and xylems. The phloem tubes carry the food down that's manufactured by the leaves down to the roots. The xylems, which I'm going to speak about for a few extra minutes here, are tubes that carry water and nutrients up from the soil up high to the leaves. You see, the leaves are in a very hostile environment, this, this, this dehydrating environment where, not, where there's no way to get water and there'd be no way for plants to put out leaves and kind of compete with other plants and start a whole evolutionary cycle here of, of tree evolution were it not for these xylem tubes. These xylem tubes form from cells that elongate and they hook up with each other and then they, they die by one of these cell suicide programs. But the walls of the plant, the walls stay. The, 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 the cellulose, the complex walls of these cells, because all plant cells have, have cell walls, the walls stay and so you get these, these uh, sieve elements and you, and you can see here the, the, uh, the water going up through these tubes. And so the plant has used death of some of its parts t in a way that, that makes it live, that, that otherwise it could, not, it could not live. And so the results of death are now part of the development of the plant. And when you look at the forest, not only is the bark dead as the protective layer, which comes from the phloem, but I like to think of the, the, more, the more visionary view with these active elements of these tubes that are bringing the water up to the leaves are results of very creative s sacrifice, in a sense, of some of the cells for the, for the, for the, for the, for the large, for the, for the greater good. And in this case, in these multicellular creatures, such as us and the plants, they would not even be were it not for death being completely incorporated into life itself. And, and so I like to say that at this point, death has now fully taken on an evolutionary role. Far from being inadvertent, it's being designed in almost in the way that birds' wings are, are for flight, for certain kinds of behaviors. Death here is a, be, is, is a behavioral design which is really part of the, part of the living structure. Okay, so I get a little excited about that. Uh, now to move on, once you have these multicellular creatures, <clears throat> you get into another topic, which is life spans. Why do they live as long as they do? Why do humans live you know, about 80 years if all goes pretty well? You know, 90, the, the oldest living one on record that we have was a woman who died about 10 years ago in France, lived to be 122. Recently, a man died in Japan who lived to about 110. They're, they're way off the charts, obviously. We, I hope everybody in this room gets to those ages. Uh, but you know, basically, there's kind of a senescence that comes in. You know, you, by the time you're, you know, you're 80, 90, you're, you're expecting you're going to probably be looking a certain kind of way. And this has to do much with evolution. So, and why do you know, mice live only a uh, you know, year or two? Or why do uh, some of these little worms live, live uh, weeks? Uh, why do, what makes creatures live as long as they do? We tend to, th larger creatures often usually live for longer periods of time. You know, we kind of accept that, but why? There's been a lot of work on this that has to do with what's called the evolutionary, theor the evolutionary basis of senescence. Because there is uh, a trade-off between preserving life and senescence. This trade-off is this. Uh, it takes a lot to keep repairing uh, these bodies, to, to have mechanisms in the cells that are repair mechanisms of all, from all, against all kinds of things that can go wrong. Anything that goes wrong that gets fought to preserve life, ha there has to be some molecular or cellular basis for that, and that means genes, enzymes, energy. And, but after, after reproductive age, you can see there'd be less of a reason to, in a way, to stay alive. In a sense, you, you may have done your job in an evolutionary sense. And so senescence start, can start kicking in. The young you know, children, you think of things young, often very healthy once they get past sort of a vulnerable age. Very, very healthy. Skin repairs itself, cuts, re bones repair themselves really easily. The repair mechanisms are just you know, incredibly good. 
that's because it's, 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 it's vitally important. Where creatures to senesce before they reproduce, they're extinct. So it's worth it in a, in a kind of a metabolic economic sense to have really strong repair mechanisms when the creatures are young, up into reproduction. But after that, it may or may not serve the lifestyle, or the trade-offs uh, to, to have these repair mechanisms. Now, there is a sense of it takes a long time to grow the large bodies, you know, an elephant, a mouse, a human being, a tree. So it doesn't make sense often to die you know, right after reproduction. Uh, but <laughs> there are creatures that do, which, which show this rule, this trade-off I'm going to talk about. And I, I don't know, you may have wondered why I showed the fish at the beginning. We're going to see the fish, we're going to see the salmon in a moment, but I want to show you first the mayfly. All of the species in the uh, mayfly, they're called the ephemerals, uh, is, is their uh, uh, a kind of a larger taxonomic name. These Insects live as larvae in, the, in, in, in streams, and they can be weeks to years in the streams uh, as, as uh, they sort of crawling around in, in their carnivores in the streams. At some point, they go into a final stage in which their bodies are transformed. They emerge from the water with their wings. They fly. They reproduce. And as many of you know, the mayflies are kind of famous for dying after reproduction. Uh, they don't just die because they, let's say, they, they want to die and they say, hey, the, you know, reproduction was you know, good, that was good enough, uh, time to you know, go on. They were actually born into this adult stage uh, with degenerate mouth parts, with di digestive systems that could not digest. Uh, it looks like the energy was put more into developing good wings, being able to fly, mate, reproduce, and then, in a sense, their job is done. And so this group of insects, and many insects are like this, uh, but sometimes it's the males, but this group of insects all have this pattern. In the uh, biology term, it's called uh, catastrophic senescence, in which, in a sense, aging and death happen catastrophically. There's no kind of gradual fading away like we have. We have kind of what's called a middle, a middle level of senescence. These fish that I showed is, a, is the first slide on my, on my uh, title slide. These fish are the Pacific salmon. Unlike the Atlantic salmon, which can reproduce and go back to the ocean and, and uh, come re do it again, the Pacific salmon, all species of them, the ones if you like to eat Pacific salmon, Alaska salmon, they all are like mayflies in that they have life cycles that they are uh, born in freshwater rivers from eggs. They live in the rivers just a little while. They go downstream and they um, eventually end up in the ocean uh, for several years, Th depending on species. This is usually a known period of time, how many years they're spending in the ocean. And then they go back to the stream of their birth. It's an incredible thing. They're far away in the ocean. They go back to the stream of their birth. It seems to be chemical signals in the rivers. It seems like they're sensitive to the exact chemicals in the, in the streams or rivers of their birth. But what happens when they get into these rivers, their bodies change. And you see here, they develop large jaws. Uh, they bulk out. They are like salmon on steroids. And they literally are. Their bodies are pumping steroids to such an extent that soon they're going to die. Now, they're, they're, they're going upstream. They're, 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 you've probably seen movies of them, you know, swimming these rapids. They, they, get, they get to the streams. They spawn. The female uh, puts out eggs. The male puts out sperms. It's, it's, it's a free kind of uh, spawn. It's, 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 in, it's in the water itself. The eggs are laid in these little depressions, and they die. The, the bears come in. The streams are filled with the dead uh, salmon. All the species of the Pacific salmon, they, they have this catastrophic senescence. Now think about it. The mayflies, the insects have this catastrophic senescence, and the Pacific salmon have the catastrophic senescence. They have two very different organisms discovered the same kind of strategy. The details of this strategy are not 
fully understood, like what made the specific salmon go have this catastrophic senescence, but the Atlantic salmon not. But some kind of trade-off gets made that it was worthwhile to go into this overdrive um, sort of suicide run to be able to maybe get far, far upstream uh, where, they, where they couldn't, they, they, maybe they got to streams that were you know, pristine. These kind of trade-offs get made, catastrophic senescence. Now, I'm going to show you a couple more examples of these wonderful uh, uh, games that evolution has played with lifespan. I'm going to go turn next to a different kind of marine creature, a, a lobster. This is a, a female lobster, and you can see the eggs at the base. This, this uh, fisherman has turned over the lobster in uh, her hand to show you the, the eggs of the lobster underneath. Now, the reason I'm showing you the lobster is because the female lobster does not have uh, menopause the way uh, humans, uh, human females do. Uh, there is not a decrease in reproduction rate. In fact, there is an increase in reproduction rate with age. The older the female lobster, the more fecundity the lobster can have. The bigger the lobster can get. And it's very interesting. The lobster can die of diseases, but the rates, the odds of getting the disease do not increase with age. Do not, it, like, like we can die of cancer at any age, but the odds of dying of cancer increase as we senesce, as our repair mechanisms get weakened as we age, during senescence, during our gradual senescence. The lobster doesn't have that. And it's under active study. It's, being, it's called negligible senescence. Organisms that seem not to senesce, again, they can die, uh, they, can, they, can, they can get damaged, uh, that, you know, they can lose a leg and maybe not grow it back. They, they can have damage, but they don't have this weakening uh, they don't have statistically higher levels of diseases as they get older. Uh, there are some fish. Orange roughies have this. And th these are under active study now because people want to know, wow, could we you know, figure, it would be nice maybe to have negligible senescence. So these are under active study. And one of the creatures that has just been discovered, not as a species in recent years, uh, but to have negligible senescence is this creature called the naked mole rat which some call the ugliest creature on the earth. But depends, those that study the creature, the naked mole rat, say no, it's the most beautiful thing once you've spent your, uh, you know, year after year in the lab with the naked mole rat. And the naked mole rats are interesting for several reasons. For one, they are like bees and ants in that they have queens. There's kind of a queen mole rat. They've evolved a, what's called eusociality, the same this is a different story. There may be a different talk. Uh, but I'm, so I'm going to skip that. But, they're inter but they've just been discovered recently. To, people have been studying these things as, hey, you know, they get, they, they, they get, old, they get worn out. I mean, their, their skins age and stuff like that, but they don't seem to be getting diseases at higher rates as they age. It's, it's recently been found that here's a mammal with this negligible senescence. Now, there's a lot of stories here having to do with why birds of the same mass live longer than mammals of the same mass. It, 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 creatures that are very highly protected, like lobsters with their shells or the mole rats with their collective, these are pretty nasty creatures, by the way, with their teeth. They can fight off predators well, and they have this collective society. Creatures that have ways of living long in potential seem to evolve me me metabolic means of living long. It sounds like kind of a circle, but it's like a hermeneutic circle or something. But it's, uh, it, it, and, and it looks like humans. It, the, so birds, because they are in trees and nests, are, can, it's called, well, the birds, are, they, they use the slogan called fly now, die later. The creatures that fly, um, that could escape predators, it was worth their bodies to develop repair mechanisms and do that extra expense in the metabolism. To, it, to in fact live long because there's a good chance the creature is going to live long. And in the mammals, the bats live extraordinarily long, are strong, extraordinarily long lived for their lifespans. We, being uh, in between body weight, between chimpanzees and gorillas, which are our two closest living uh, relatives on the planet, genetic relatives, uh, 
it turns out chimpanzees and gorillas live about 40 years as their natural la lifespan until they senesce. We're about 80, we're about double. So it looks like during human evolution, uh, the fact that we may perhaps were social and had very good survival mechanisms, because we are an incredibly successful species that we've populated the entire planet. One of the benefits we got from this tuning of, by evolution of lifespan to lifestyle, it looks like was approximately doubling our, our longevity from a primate ancestor uh, in the biological evolutionary past. This is before all the interest in the naked mole rat, which we're going to try to live longer by you know, genetic uh, means. So we're getting now to the last stage, well, the second last stage, but the second last stage is related to this, the awareness of mortality. In all this process, going from the immortal atoms to the origin of life the, and the origin of death, the inadvertent death that powers evolution, the evolution of programmed cell death in the bacteria, the evolution of mul complex multicellular creatures that have this programmed cell death to sculpt and maintain complex differentiated bodies, to now those bodies having lifespans of various lengths that are tuned to their, life, to the, to their lifestyle. We got evolution, got to a stage that produced creatures that could know all this and represent death internally. So this stage I call the awareness of mortality. Death now takes on a new evolutionary stage, a cultural evolutionary stage, in which we can think about death and it comes into cultural discussion. We can have different attitudes towards death. We can select different attitudes towards death. Cultures can uh, kind of channel the people in the culture to feel, to, to sort of all have similar funeral rituals. Death can start being sculpted in a cultural way, not that differently from the way language gets sculpted or technology gets sculpted by having variation and selection, but on a cultural scale. And this is where we get into people like Hakuin, the Zen master, saying, use death as a koan to reach some kind of illumination, or somebody else saying, don't stare at it too long. You know, it's going to disturb you. It burn you out in some kind of way. But we know from the archaeological record that some kind of awareness of death that is more than the biological body dying goes back tens of thousands of years. This is one of the most famous burials that is really old. This is, this is Upper Paleolithic in Sungir, Russia. And it was found, uh, at the top is what was found, at the bottom is sort of an artist's reconstruction of what it looked like at the moment of burial. This was an active burial. This was not just disposing of the body to try to get rid of decay from, this, from the clan or taking it away. This was burying it with, uh, with, with grave goods. And uh, you see these, they were wrapped up in claws. Uh, there were bones of other mammals around them. Uh, here's what it actually looked like. There were uh, clothes of beads, tens of thousands of beads. It's, it's, it's suspected these individuals were uh, very important in some kind of way. Uh, there were, th these show you some of the beads. These, these beads were carved of, ma the small ones were mammoth ivory, and the large ones are fox teeth. So carnivores, a lot of times these burials had carnivore teeth or carnivore bones. Some of the early burials had bare bones laid across the chests of people. You know, we can only guess at what's going on, but it doesn't take too much imagination to, to be there in, in a way, to, to, to bury your, your, your friends or relatives with, uh, you know, with, the, with these, some kind of symbols of, of, of um, afterlife or respect or, or hunting. Uh, it, this is, again, 28,000 years ago, way before there was any writing. We, we assume that there was pretty sophisticated language. These people had fish hooks. They had clothing. Uh, this is the time of the cave art in France, the famous Lascaux and the famous caves of France. 
Uh, it's been surmised that, the, that these people practice shamanistic rituals. Here you see a Huichol shaman, a present-day Huichol shaman of Mexico. Uh, one of the, uh, but we can study modern-day shamanism. And one of the interesting aspects about shamans is that these people who can go off into the other worlds and come back with information for their society, who can have adventures in these other worlds, often if you read books like Marcel Eliade, the scholar of shamanism, it turns out that the people that become shamans often had near-death experiences as children or teenagers. They often went through, or they were, or they were put into great hardship as uh, starvation situations uh, as a result uh, be prior to becoming shaman, or the, or the early near-death experiences gave them certain capabilities that the society felt, hey, we want to train this person uh, to be a shaman. So there's kind of a relationship between, uh, there started being a relationship between dying mentally, uh, dying to old self, and being reborn in new selves that is almost universal through many, many cultures. Uh, and this is in in people like I mentioned, like, like Hakuin, the, the Zen master as well, of, of dying now so you don't have to die later, so you don't have to be afraid of death. Uh, this is sometimes called a psychopomp, uh, with those that can go into the other world and come back uh, with information. So death was starting to be seen as another place, a, a time zone and it's another place. Well, I, what I want to take you now to end, end this talk with is that perhaps uh, we're coming to another stage, but it's hard to define this stage. I call this stage, and I have stage seven, question marks, the awareness of the awareness of mortality, or perhaps a meta-awareness. Because what I want to suggest is that as we start with the science now, we can start understanding all these different scales of death. And so it's not just the human death that we have to be afraid of, or afraid of our parents dying, or loved ones dying, or, or people we love in society that are, we don't even know necessarily, or great leaders, whatever. We don't just have to be fearful of, the, the, of death on the human scale, uh, even though we don't want to die. Uh, I, 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 I want to say that I totally support trying to live as long as uh, possible. Uh, but, but we may be coming to some stages of needing to be aware of our own awareness because I. There's been some experimental evidence, and I'm going to mention just briefly, if you're interested, you can look this up, called terror management theory. And this has nothing to do with political terrorism. This is a, a branch of social psychology which is talking about the terror, the knowledge of mortality. That it's, it's, it, it's not really a pleasant thought. This is the don't stare at the sun too long side, uh, in which it's disturbing, and it should be disturbing, because it's a threat to your, bi to your biological continuation, which we've been evolved to, to, to want to continue. The terror management theory. So I'll mention a few words about it. But the reason I say that this, this uh, awareness of awareness is not clear when it begins, whether it's another stage, it, I want to bring up Gilgamesh. Uh, we're, we're not too far from Mesopotamia here in uh, the UAE. Mesopotamia has the site of the world's oldest recorded narrative, uh, which is the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in this epic, Gilgamesh, the great king, a warrior, goes off on this journey uh, with his uh, friend uh, Enkidu, and the friend dies. And Gilgamesh realizes at this moment that he is going to die too. And it's very disturbing. And what Gilgamesh does is then starts searching for an elixir of immortality. Okay, good, good first response, right? I don't like it. There must be some plant out there that's going to help me out. But it's interesting, I think, that in this oldest surviving narrative, a major turning point in the narrative is the awareness of mortality. Gilgamesh searches for an elixir of immortality. Buddhism, uh, Buddha on his deathbed, and I'm not going to go through like all the world's religions. I would, I'd love to do that, but, but I just want to point out a few. Gilgamesh on his deathbed, in different translations, but this translation says, he says to his followers, all individual be things pass away. Seek your liberation with diligence. And some translations have it, you know, get on the stick now. <laughs> 
don't waste any time, you're going to die, you know, start, start working your way to some kind of enlightenment now, because it's going to take some time. Uh, this is starting to be an aware, commenting on how we should treat death. So this is the cultural evolution of death, the awareness of awareness. Epicurus, Greek philosopher in the BCE, very famous philosopher of death. Death is nothing to us, Epicurus said, because, we, and it was, he was really saying we shouldn't be afraid of it because it's like you're, you're not afraid of where were you before you were born or, you know, we, or what non-existence was like before you were born. So it's, non-existence is not going to be painful. What's really painful is your thoughts now uh, about it. And Epicurus had this whole four-part cure of which this death is nothing to us was part, which was kind of a four things if you remember, you can go to, to liberation. Epicurus did not say this was easy to incorporate, easy to say, but difficult to make part of yourself, to really make part of your inner self. And I want to go to this awareness of awareness of death in the more modern sense and mention something called that I said was called terror management theory. Uh, there's a, a movie called The Flight from Death, The Quest from Immortality. The terror management people, such as Jeff Greenberg, Sheldon Solomon, I know them, I'm friends with them, uh, but they're social psychologists and there's many others. Uh, Ernst, they, they were using a, a theory developed by Ernst Becker, who won a Pulitzer Prize for a 1973 book called The Denial of Death, in which Becker postulated that the awareness of death was operating on us unconsciously to make us driven to form all kinds of social structures that we're not even aware are ways of overcoming the disturbing quality of death. And people like Greenberg and Sheldon Solomon and the others, there's hundreds of papers uh, in the social psychology literature from many different countries showing that when people are very gently reminded of the fact of mortality in these experiments, like in questionnaires, that are, and they're not told the experiments about this, they have enhanced worldview defense. They form in-group uh, bonding and out-group hostility to a greater extent. They can be made to denigrate uh, f uh, foreigners or those of a different religion more forcefully by being mildly reminded of, of the fact of death during the course of many other things happening in the experiment. And so they're showing by some experiments that the knowledge of mortality is affecting us unconsciously to create, to, you know, not that culture is only that, but the, these, are, these are cutting edge. We don't quite understand the extent to which death is it creating life, in a way creating these, these great social institutions and cultural institutions and building uh, you know, huge structures and this is just being explored, the intertwining of death and life on the psychological scale that is important in, in culture. I'm just going to mention one other person, Douglas Hofstadter, who wrote a very famous book, I think it was also a Pulitzer Prize winning, called Gödel, Escher, and Bach. Uh, but his most recent book is I Am a Strange Loop. And in this book, the loopiness has to do with uh, complexity theory. And he does a whole thing of Gödel's theorem and that he thinks the consciousness has to do with this complexity theory. But, but in the book, he talks about his wife's death. And uh, he, he, post he postulates, and I agree with this. It was very similar to what I wrote in my first death book. I've written two now on it looking at death on different scales, he postulates that we are much less entities than we tend to think. We, we, we are these loops of interpenetrating psychologies that are more merged with each other than you would think given just our separate bodies with skins and the fact that we can walk around as individuals. So Hofstetter is one who's postulating new ways of thinking about the self by getting letting death disturb him, then thinking about what it is to be a human self. And these terror management people are doing that too. So there's a lot more to say about culture, but I do want to, uh, to end with, maybe I'll, f I'll finish with a, a quote from uh, Hakuin, the Zen master I started off with about something about uh, death, because 
he had said, uh, if you have the desire to see into your own nature, you should first investigate the word death. If you want to know how to investigate this word, then at all times, while walking, standing, sitting, or reclining, without despising activity, without being caught up in quietude, merely investigate this. After you are dead and cremated, in his word here, where is the main character gone? Then in a night or two, or at most a few days of this intense concentration, you will obtain the decisive and ultimate joy. This is Hakuin 1686 to 1769. Well, I don't know if I can promise that you will obtain this in just a couple days by uh, meditating on this word death uh, day and night uh, incessantly, whether you are in activity or quietude. But I do hope that by thinking of the about the intertwining of death and life on different scales and how we contain all these scales in us from the immortal atoms of carbon that get circled uh, around the biosphere and go in and out of different creatures to the uh, inadvertent nature of death that powered evolution, that, which is why we're here, that the humans species came into existence about 150,000 to 200,000 years ago. How the bacteria developed program cell death, which allowed certain kinds of suicide programs to exist. That when the eukaryotic cell came into existence, those suicide programs got used in a much more advanced level as something that could be sculpted by the evolutionary process to be part of the giving rise to complex creatures such as fungi and plants, as I showed you, that shoot up into the sky because they have the tubes of death within them that are part, actually part of life, and the sculpting of our hand and the sculpting of our body. So the death gets used in a very complex way to sculpt and be part of life of the multicellular creature, the complex creature, and how these complex creatures such as us have life spans that are tuned to a, to a life cycle, how our senescence, the length of our life cycle, is somehow tuned to our ecological niche that we've occupied on the planet, and how we've probably doubled our lifespan by being smart, brainy creatures over the last several million years, and then how we got so smart that we were able to realize we're going to be mortal, which can be very, very disturbing. It was not probably, so we probably, our smarts were not selected to know that fact. It was probably a byproduct, a disturbing byproduct. But it had to be dealt with. And once it had to be dealt with, we can represent it, and then it becomes part of a cultural evolutionary process that can be sculpted by people saying and battling and suggesting and cajoling each other to take on various attitudes towards death as part of forming stable complex societies and how now we can use science. I've shown you a few examples of how, how science and advanced thinking and philosophy and particularly experimental social science is getting used to look into how death forms uh, a fundamental matrix of dynamics in our psyche that probably has cultural implications of all of which we're not even aware of yet, but some of which are getting uncovered by science. So the message there is to stay tuned. The story is not done yet. But you can know some of what I've already told you about today. These are, I tried to stick with things that are not sort of right happening now that might be superseded, so I didn't get into studies about uh, Im immortality or longevity, but facts, fundamental facts of the way the universe has been going in stages of the intertwining of life and death that you can take on. And since they're all in us, I like to, uh, what what's I've gotten from this is a uh, more enhanced feeling of gratitude for this great cosmic process in which life and death have been intertwined into different forms that have formed us for what we are. And so even though uh, I and all of you are creatures that are, are going to die. I was going to say probably going to die, uh, because some of, you know, some of you that are young, who knows what medical advances are happening. So 
I like, and maybe for myself, I, like to, I should qualify that. Uh, but probably the better attitude is to take a sense of, you know, we are going to die, and so let's work it out with diligence and, uh, and try to learn what we can to take a, from, our, from the natural world a sense of the tremendous uh, uh, composition that is out there of these different intertwinings of, of life and death. So I'll uh, close at that point, at this point. <laughs> and, uh... My question is in regards to your concept of, uh, or the concept of catastrophic uh, senescence. Um, basically, has it been hypothesized, or could it be that uh, this is due to some kind of evolutionary um, response to a predatory um, sort of existence so that uh, these creatures couldn't exist uh, long enough to avoid this predatory uh, attack. Um, what I mean is... Very interesting. Basically, so, so that creatures that uh, reproduced faster or reached the mating stage faster um, were able to su survive more, or survive uh, more. Right, right, to put all their effort into the reproduction. Exactly. That's, so that, you know, the first thing is, that's very effort. interesting. I think there might be something there. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that the Pacific South Northwest has the grizzly bear, which would be a, 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 a vicious predator of the salmon coming up these streams, whereas the Atlantic coast of the United States, uh, uh, and I guess parts of Europe that would have the salmon would, would not. They'd have, they'd have bears, but, well, of course, then we have to go back in time when, they, when the grizzly was more widespread. I don't know, but it's an interesting idea. It's definitely worth, the, I don't know it being suggested, but it sounds uh, like a feasible uh, research program to, to me to maybe compare these creatures of different with that have catastrophic senescence and see if they have anything in common that might have driven it. R really good comment. It's not really a question. Um, could you speak to either both or either of these topics in relation to cell suicide, autoimmune diseases, or webbed fingers uh, with children, children born with webbed fingers? Uh, not really, but I, could, I just could tell you a couple things about cancer from uh, my stu study of the literature. Cancer. Uh, one of the aspects of cancer cells is that the cell suicide program has been disabled by mutation. And so when the cancer cell's aberrant in its reproduction, it, 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 in normal cells that get aberrant that have one mutation would go into the suicide programs and, and sort of clean up the cell for the, for the body. But the cancer cells have a second mutation, which is to disable the suicide program. The fact that the cancer cells needs two or more mutations means is why it's rare, fortunately. Uh, the autoimmune disease you talk about of, the, of attacking your own body cells, um, which I've sort of, I have a sort of dealing with part of that myself in a way, uh, I, I can't say too much about it, but it could definitely be related to, to the, the cell suicide programs. It seems very reasonable, but I don't know, if, uh, I, don't, I can't address that directly. Mm. Yes, in the second row. Okay, uh, Somebody will Mike's bring coming. Microphone's coming. Hello, thank you for the nice lecture. Um, my question is, um, are we the only living being um, aware of our own death, or are there other beings? That's and then a, it's a really good question. My other question, if I may, is um, are there actually in this world, um, um, how do you say, immortal um, entities N that are li alive, uh, not carbon atoms, but or carbon alive, yes, uh, alive. carbon like life. Okay, uh, okay. The first question about other creatures being aware, I think a lot of the cognitive scientists would say no. Yet the people that work with animals really closely are finding some unusual phenomena. Uh, there's some examples of chimpanzees in which the baby has died and the mother carries it around for quite a period of time, uh, seeming to be upset uh, at its death. And there's something called uh, animal fu uh, elephant funerals, in which when elephants die, there's some examples of, of elephants, the elephant group. And there's elephants form very tight groups in, in which dominant females are, are, are leading the group, form a line and go past the dead elephant. Uh, there's also, uh, examples, there's an example on film I like to show of 
of hippopotamuses that there was a dead hippo on the shore and the hippos come out during the night when the hyenas are coming and they're trying to keep the hyenas away from this, uh, this dead body. Eventually they have to give up. Uh, crocodiles come in and lions come in, they have to give up, but there, there is sort of an inexplicable trying to keep other animals away from the dead one of their own. So, so, it's, so it's really interesting. Now whether they're aware of their own mortality, I guess I, I the side of that requires a fairly sophisticated uh, representation. The, it, it seems to be in the human development, children, it can be almost any age, but it, it's generally around six, five, six, seven, eight, where that comes in. When I was first telling people I was writing books on uh, multi-scale death and how death enhances life, and there's a certain celebratory nature to death because life wouldn't be what it, was, what it is without death. Uh, about 50% of the people I've talk, I talk to say that they can remember when they were children, when they had that, when they realized that, that you know, people were dying, or not, not that there was an example of death, but all people die and they were a person that dies. So it might be a little bit of a sophisticated cognitive uh, representation is needed for that. But still, it's hard to tell with animals, right? Because you can't exactly ask them. So the cognitive psychologists try to tease out these things with animals in, in, in nonverbal ways, with pictures or with behaviors. So that, that's this, this issue of animal awareness, I do have to say, is, is, is a very hot topic in cognitive psychology. Uh, I'd like to uh, follow up on, on, on the question and your explanation. These seems to be examples of uh, animals who are aware of death at the moment of death, whereas a human uh, seems yeah. to be aware of death long before, actually right. before the phenomenon. Um, so is that a significant distinction? And the question that I would have as another follow-up is, what actually does it mean to be aware of death long before death? Huh. And, and what do you mean by that question being? Well, what the awareness it's a big entails. What the awareness entails if death is not around. Mm. And what's your, what are your own thoughts, just to, to start me off on that a little bit? Because <laughs> if, if you're interested in it, you must have some, uh, not, well, not, not necessarily conclusion, but you could. Well, I, I would, uh, well, I couldn't say argue, but I, my in intuitive answer would be that our awareness is very low because we seem to suppress uh, the acute awareness of death in our normal lives. Correct. R we rather uh, like I to think. put it beyond the horizon of our, of our daily lives. Mm. So I'm not entirely sure what then, what really means that we are aware of death, is it a philosophical aha elitness that you suddenly realize that there is an end to life, or are we really aware of death? I realize that this is not a, a not, not a proper answer to to your right, question, but right. Well, some of the, the some of these social psychologists, their their results seem to be indicating that the disturbance that the awareness causes when we first figure this out when we're children or middle middle eight, you know, like five, six, seven, eight, whatever leads into things such as burning ambition, uh, you know, ways of kind of overcoming this disturbance that are not questing for immortality in an elixir, but questing for other kinds of immortality. This, this, this psychologist Ernst Becker in his book Den Denial of Death had what he called immortality projects, which had to do with uh, various religions, various quests for fame, various fe quests for renown. Uh, there's material coming out now, just in the New York Times last week, about you know the internet as kind of a form of immortality. If you get enough of your blogs being read and keep circulating, uh, you know, th so so that would be a possibility, which I think should be uh, thought about and investigated uh, more. Does this seem to resonate with something you might be thinking? Pardon? as an answer to death. Twitter as an answer to death, yes, yeah, exactly. I mean, why does something like Twitter, well, there's many reasons something like Twitter could catch on so quickly. One is our, our desire to be social, but I think things like the unconscious dynamics of, of knowing we are going to die uh, way ahead of time is probably playing a role. It, it would be hard to believe it's not playing some kind of role. 
Hi. And just reacting on that uh, as a psychologist, I was wondering if you ever considered uh, the school of psychoanalysis, a psycho psychoanalysis. Analysis as a source of answer regarding death. Freud, I mean, Freud had a lot to say about death. Uh, yeah, I didn't go into that, and I'm not an expert in it, but uh, yes, Lacan and uh, you know, many of these, Norman Brown, uh, many of these people, life, uh, you know, beyond life and death, uh, you know, definitely, I think it'd be a rich, you want, if you want to say a few words, please. Oh, just wait a second for the, uh, for the microphone so everyone can hear. <clears throat> She just wants to say that death. Uh, just death. <laughs> um, in clinical psychology, death uh, may have, uh, at least for certain uh, schools, a direct impact on behavior. Like you said before, it was studied for groups. It's def definitely where I believe it is. Oh, can you speak a little bit more into that? Um, that uh, sorry, that death has a, a direct impact on individual behavior. Yeah. I mean, the fear of death. Uh, now we can go into the unconscious or the conscious, what's conscious or not. But uh, um, if, you know, I, you know, uh, psychoanalysis has been debated whether uh, it's scientific or not. Mm -hmm. um, and the Europeans tend to lean more towards it than Americans. Mm -hmm. But um, now they are also strong, a strong school in America. Um, but yeah, it seems to show that it has an effect on uh, human behavior. Mm -hmm. Not just on groups. Yeah, and like the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung, in his writings, uh, clearly some of his dreams that were uh, death and resurrection dreams were really important when he writes in his autobiography of, of personal advances of getting into archetypes. And, and so, so it's a really rich topic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I just wondered what you uh, thought of uh, People who believe in reincarnation believe that they have had uh, prior lives and how that affects, um, you know, their thinking of, or the, the process of, of dying in, in those people versus those that don't believe in it. Right, right. Well, I think it's a, a very uh, interesting phenomenon to try to uh, figure out maybe through some experiments. I personally think that it does reincarnation in a personal kind of way does not exist. We, that we do not. I do. I don't think I go on as a, as a single entity uh, after I die. So the idea, the Hindu idea, let's say, of of getting reincarnated into a, a per, another person or a wealthy person or a frog, you know, based upon the karma in this life, uh, I, I do not think that that is true in a literal sense. Uh, but the fact that they believe it could be uh, a quest for an immort it could be a grabbing onto an immortality project. People will say they have past life memories of things that could never happen that have been verified. I'm not under the understanding where you know some, that somebody would know something about where some Greek tablet was buried that they could tell an archaeologist and actually you know go find it. Uh, but I think that the imagination's ability to put ourselves into other lives is itself uh, kind of interesting to think about. Uh, I, I'm not a scholar of various explanations for the belief in reincarnation, the various things that can happen to your brain. Well, the, the, for, the, I, I know there's, issue, there's things about c certain kinds of sleep patterns that may give rise to what they call out-of-body experiences. It's something called uh, a sleep paralysis in which your mind is active but your body is paralyzed. This is a well-known phenomenon and they, they realize that some of these people that have this happen to them also report out-of-body experiences, being able to fly off and experience. So that, that seems to be, have some, neuro, some neurological basis to it. Uh, but I can't really say more detail about the, the reincarnation literature uh, as such. How, how do you explain that uh, women tend to live longer than men, given that yeah, wow. men remain... It's a bummer, <laughs> isn't it? At least for <laughs> half, longer than women. <laughs> for half of us, it's a bummer. But for the other half, you know, more, more longer life to you glorious women. Um, I have not seen a really good explanation for it. Uh, you know, they, there was some that has to do with the, men, the male metabolism well, uh, circular reasoning, sort of burning itself out you know, with sort of testosterone uh, or 
um, or needing to be, that the, somehow the correlation with strength and the, the males being stronger and maybe needing to do more dangerous tasks in, the, in human evolution, well, except for childbirth, right, which is pretty dangerous too. But I have not seen good explanations for this. Uh, it's, it's really interesting that it's in all cultures. It's in the, Jap the Japanese right now are the cultures with the, both the men and the women as a kind of a, a not, not just a small pocket, but the entire culture has the longest lifespans on the planet of both men and women, but the women live longer. And then you can go to different countries, you know, uh, you know Sweden, places in Africa, India, and they have different life, natural lifespans due to, uh, well, not biological lifespans, we think that that's universal, but due to the diseases or the difficulties that exist in that country. And women, once they're passed, uh, you know, if they, if they are not, di well, I'm not sure how, the, how it's measured, but it's, um, that they're living longer. In other words, that, that increment is, is, is universal. So there's something in the repair mechanism. Does the uh, fear of death uh, decreases in uh, as, uh, a person age? Wow, does the fear of death decrease with the person ages? Um, I, I hope so. Uh, that would be, yes. I, I mean, I hope, if they're finding happiness generally increases. People, people complain about the body falling apart, but there's a lot of studies that, that one starts learning how not to get upset about the things that used to upset you when you were young. You know, it's like, don't sweat the small stuff that seems to make a more general well-being. Um, when my father died a few years back, he was, you know, he was definitely upsetting. Uh, I mean, he was definitely um, <laughs> upset. He was, he was definitely accepting in a certain kind of sense that this was it. I, I really gained a lot, actually, from his kind of courage in the last uh, few weeks. So I don't know if you were talking about like that, that kind of time or just generally as you get older, but I really hope that because mortality is getting closer, so I really hope that wisdom grows. Wi the, the wisdom body is getting healthier as the physical body is declining. I, I'm definitely going to assume that as a personal philosophy, and so I hope you do too. And I think, why, why not? We might as well, if death is something we can manipulate in our own the evolution of our own cognitive being. That's something we can think about, mm, do I want to think about death that way or this way? So this evolutionary process, I believe, can happen in our own minds as we evaluate different avenues for taking it on. I would suggest, yes, let's, let's try to evaluate the avenue of, of, of wisdom and re realism toward it. And I think what we do need in education is, is more of an inculcation about, about this. I think we do need more discussions and more and maybe getting children and young adults to, to think about these, some of these aspects so we can get, because I think it is, I really am convinced that it is, it can be an important part of wisdom. And so then we need to, we need to think about, is that, do you want to follow up at all or is that, uh, if you want to say a few words, I, I get a sense you might want to, yes. No, I, I mean, is there any scientific studies done in this, uh, to this question? Exactly along those lines, I don't know. I just was citing the scientific studies that have been coming out about about aging and a general feeling of well-being due to not getting worried about things that used to worry you. But I don't know where death comes in on that, I have to say. I, I would just like to comment, actually, that it, there does seem to be some correlation between people's, as people age, their, uh, how, their, how happy they are and how healthy they are and how mm. long they live. And I don't really know which comes first, the chicken or the egg, but mm. I do think that uh, mm. it seems to me, from my personal experience of you know, interacting with many different people and reading many different uh, you know, types of literature, for example, that the human individual reacts in a very um, you know, individual way to the idea of death. Mm. But I think that, the, just as you said, you can cultivate a certain attitude and a certain uh, mind frame about it, which will, in, which can, you know, you can, which can influence your personal experience, mm. and also externalization of it can influence other people. And then that gives rise to this whole dialogue about how death is perceived, I guess, in the in the culture. Mm. Yeah, I guess if you're thinking about, of course, you could be. I was going to say, don't be Kafka 
and uh, or, or, or don't be uh, uh, who, like philosophers of pessimism that are also often really involved in death. But then they and they've written books that we're still reading in philosophy classes. Sure, but there are also <laughs> but, stories. But for I would example, say go the other route. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. But there are also, there are also examples of you know individuals in literature who are you know as they come closer to death like are driven insane by this idea and they go to great lengths to try to you know overcome this, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Right. So what you, one could examine oneself and saying, as I'm thinking about this, am I increasing my well-being and my gratitude? Am I is that being is that the the plant that's growing as a result of the right, seeds I'm planting? Right, and I think if you do if you do conceptualize this, then you can strive for something. If you don't really think about it, if you don't take it out and stare at the sun for at least a second or two, then you can't really hope to uh, formulate an intentioned uh, response to it. Right. Right. Intentioned way of handling it. Right. If you haven't had some experience, and then you can think about it. Thank you very much. Excellent lecture, really. Uh, to follow up with the last comment, uh, uh, do you think the style of life, what, uh, I can surmise from what you have uh, given in interviews in the website, uh, with the rising standard of living, you said, or style of life, age will rise. That means pe people will live more. But is that a, a, a hypothesis which cannot be challenged? Because if you, if you take this as a given, uh, you find people in different anthropological areas, like rural, tribal, and uh, urban. You find different uh, ages going on. Some people ages uh, till, till hundreds in urban centers. Some people in rural areas ages till 120. So there are different uh, uh, scale in that. And uh, you have also, I could mention something else. You have a book called Death and uh, Sex. Mm -hmm. uh, can you el elaborate more on that? Thank you very much. Well, it was a co-written book, and I, I wrote the death half. And <laughs> <laughs> Somebody says to me, like, why did you choose that one? Why did you choose that half? Well, we had both written, anyway, Dorian Sagan <laughs> wrote the sex part because we had both written previous books that we were now sort of condensing into a more of a user-friendly form, I guess. Uh, well, the point you bring up about all cultures have had people that live very old is really important. That shows that that there's almost like a, a, there's a natural lifespan. There's sort of a natural maximum lifespan that doesn't really have to do with whether you got a certain kind of disease when you were 20 or not. Uh, Michelangelo, the great Florentine uh, artist, lived till the 80s. There's always been people living to their 80s or, or older, even they were in cultures where the lifespan may have been 30. So that's a really important point you bring up. A as we fight these diseases, people are living longer. S there's a big debate now in the research community on, on aging of whether that's going to be kind of a ceiling that we're going to start, so many things are going wrong at some point that medicine cannot keep people together. That's one side. It's saying we, we can fight the cancers, the heart disease. We're going to do this all very good. So let's get everybody living into the 80s or 90s. Then that will probably be all kinds of things are going wrong, and we won't be able to keep them all alive except with tremendous expense or hooked up to tubes or something. So there's going to be sort of natural, and the, and the body's so complex, the genetics are so complex, if you, you, you're, you're not going to be able to give a pill because that pill, if it does something with the mitochondria in your body to keep you, to, to change the suicide programs, something else is going to go terribly wrong. That's one side. There are some researchers that, are, that have been showing with the worms, for example, that there could be genetic modifications that, these, they, that creatures live much longer. And so there's some breakthroughs happening that are making some researchers saying, yes, senescence at some point starts happening at a much more dramatic rate, an accelerating rate. But there's hope. We're going to find out. We're going to find out the molecular details of that process. So hang on you know, as long as you can, because good news is coming from bio. And I don't, have, uh, I don't have an informed, I'm not in the trenches, so to speak, of that work to, to tell you, this is, you know, follow this side. I'll say, hey, go, go for the side that says hang on. But if that makes you have lots of psychology that is going to 
caused you not to have wisdom if it turns out the hang-on side was not right. Maybe you should take the other side, too. <laughs> use, I, both, use both sides of your brain on that one. I think there is research that shows that if you keep an active mind the, as you age, the quality of your life is improved in mm. a more sustained way. Yeah. And so I would like, on behalf of your audience, to thank <laughs> you for improving our quality of mind.